and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the madman behind numerous games under the Black Oath um, label, and now coming back to us with Ruthless Heaven's Boundless Fate, the one and only Alex T. How are you doing today, man? Hey, I'm, I'm great. Thanks for having me again. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. It's good. It's good to see. It's good to see you. And I'm. I have been noticing a bit of a bit of a pattern with this one and some of the previous entries that I've that I've had you on in a roundabout way going all the way back to sacrifice and that is seeing how far you can stretch the the concept of um of OSR in terms of setting and tone was, Yeah well <laughs> was that like I a happy that's accident fair. or No in in this case um I was I'm, I, I'll consider a Ruthless Heaven's Boundless Fate an OSR game mostly due to the fact that it started off as a, as a hack for Dungeon Crawl Classics. It has a lot of that same DNA, the kind of uh, the same style of saving throws, um, six attributes, no skills, and well, that that's sort of a little bit uh, over the top stuff going on um so yeah mechanically i i guess it's it's quite o osr but definitely not thematically it's not your typical osr game so yeah, yeah I, I suppose i'm stretching the, the definition in that sense yeah. quite a lot which i think i think it should be we don't need we don't need a billionth crawl <laughs> or not a billion yeah, crawl a billion, probably not a billion a billion thumb a billionth dark dark fantasy game that is do, that is doing that is doing fantasy cir circa 1978. Yeah, I, I've I've done that already with Sacrifice, and I intend to keep digging in that direction with that game. So, I, I, it's just it didn't make any sense to do the same in a different way. So, yes, this time I'm going to space. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that br that brings so with this one you meant you mentioned a few um, influences, and there are there are some that I there are some that were pretty were pretty cut and dry as far as far as where as far as where it came. There's a, there's a few others that I'd be curious to the method behind the madness. Now. Dungeon Crawl Classics, you already mentioned that this was intended as a hack that evolved into its own thing, which um, that puts you in good company. <laughs> oh. Yeah, definitely. But I could see Ultraviolet Grasslands in the in the sense of being that being a similar vein of weird fiction. I could also see Mobius, especially given the visual style you're going for, that very much feels like something he would do. Um, yeah. but some of the some of the other one some of the other ones like um, Scavenger's Reign. I th I think that one you should get into the skinny of because I think a lot of people aren't going to be familiar with Scavenger's Reign. Well, Scavenger's Reign. It's in my opinion the best and one of the best TV shows ever done. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a science fiction. So that aired, I think it was last year, and um, two years ago. But um, no, no, it, it no, it two aired, years ago it already. Last yeah. year, I, I don't. It, it was announced two years yeah. ago. Um, yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a typical story. A crew that crash lands on a very strange planet, and visually is absolutely stunning. It's really Moebius completely, one hundred percent Moebius influenced. And but the story is also very very original. Everything in the planet is out to kill them, but it has some weird symbiosis between all the among all the life forms living in the planet. So 
um, I wanted to explore that weirdness and weird features that you can find in not only in a single planet but in a whole galactic sector. And and of course, eventually, a lot of the influences I I listed there on on, on that well on the preview you I I sent you. Um, they are mostly visual because for me it was very important to approach this project um, from a visual point of view, so I could um, communicate it better to the to the artists and and tell them, okay, this is the direction I want with the art. I I was very careful picking the style of artists that will fit this sort of project more, um, uh, very very creative and very. Oh, yeah, I'm web you so orientated in general, yeah. Yes, very specific to, to the style I was going for. So, yes, definitely Scavenger's Rain in that sense is a very big influence. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you had also brought up um, the art of uh, Rodney Matthews. And since we're talking about visual, yeah. I think that'd be another one to go into. And definitely. <laughs> Rod yes, I, all these, all his. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. He's an, he's an artist who I think I think a lot of people have seen, even if they don't know the name. Especially if they are big fans of like high concept um, metal album covers, or or even just or even just early sci fi and fantasy. Yeah, it, and absolutely stunning. It's from seventies, eighties. Mm. Has done a lot of. Is is like you said? Is is the typical author that maybe we artists we don't know his name, people don't know his name, but once you see it, you say, "Oh, okay, it's this guy," because his his art is is everywhere. Once you are a little bit into that kind of science fiction retro stuff, yeah, I mean, he's one of the absolute classics. Mm -hmm. So yes, definitely his his visuals. I wanted to to name him as a big influence. Also, his his worlds and his understanding of science fiction as I, I is something I, I aspire to with this, with this game. And with all of these, there is there is a theme in the, in um the type of the type of um pulp SF that is significantly removed from the large men with screwdrivers concept that a lot of people are used to with science fiction. You know the yeah. The stuff in like the seventies or even the fifties that was blurring the lines between the two, and I'm not sure if I explained the concept of large men with screwdrivers, which wasn't even my wasn't even my term, but it basically revolves around um, a type of science fiction that is technical people solving a technical problem. You know, your S Star Trek yeah. falls in Star Trek falls into this, um, especially like especially a lot of TOS era Star Trek. Um, two thousand one is pro is probably one of the big one of the biggest examples. Um, and while that while that has its place, um, there is an issue with that being th the sole idea about what science fiction is. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I agree completely. Agree. Yeah, you know, we've talked about we talked about variety of. SF, of SF and of just just variety pe period is important otherwise things get stagnant uh, now with that in with that in mind the other the other um, one that I find interesting is bringing up lit RPG which is a genre that I haven't tackled on this channel since I did since I did the infinity's edge um, review a few years back. Yeah, so the well, I've been binging the, since I discovered the genre, <laughs> different series nonstop for the past I don't know, a couple of years at least, like one after the other. Because I, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of um, long series of books. I, I used to read a lot of just single stories or short stories or science fiction, fantasy, everything. But um, for the past at least five, six years, I've been obsessed with long series that never end. The longer, the better, which I know for a lot of people is, it sounds horrible, but I, I just like 
long stories. I hate endings in general. The endings are depressing. <laughs> so when a story, when a book stretches on for twelve, four hundred page books, is perfect for me. So I I realize that a lot of these um, lit RPG series are enormous. They they are never ending, and on top of that, they are very very fun. So I've been getting into all the typical tropes. And I applied a lot of those in, in, in into this game, into Ruthless Heaven, Spotless Fate, which is a strong influence from from the Shansha genre, and uh, the typical idea of some kind of system, cosmic force, something that uh, completely upends the protagonist's life, and they are forced to become stronger and and better, and and into fights so they and then train and cultivate so they can get into bigger fights and so all those kind of tropes they're all in the game yeah I, it's just i find it very very fun <laughs> i'll have to sh- also show you one mobile project that unfortunately nobody can play anymore even though i still i still have the pc port archived called god of blades which was its own little tribute to this kind of thing um it was an interest it was an interesting beast back then back then um and it cer- it certainly fit it certainly would fit within that especially when i'm when i'm trying to when i'm trying when i was going through this i was trying to envision how i would have a um boundless heavens not about not boundless heavens ruthless heavens game sound and as strange as it may sound the uh, the audio style that i'm that came to mind is the stuff that Philip Glass made for the Kotsi trilogy. Um, especially Koyanis Kotsi. You know, I'm, have, I'm not familiar with that, sorry. Um having a having a very a, a very at a very atmospheric, very very slow very slow toned um, approach that's also very lo- that's also have having very um low musical notes. Uh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I'll ha- I will have to. That's one of those things I'll have to I'll have to share with you because I do think it kind it kind of fits, and I'd like to see if I'm I'm on po- I'm on point with that. But yeah, yeah, please please send it send it over when you can. Mm-hmm. Now, with some with some of the previous entries that you that you've done, there's the there's the concept of the player characters being a certain concept, rather that rather than using them, and that concept being significantly wide in terms of how you can develop it, rather than a specific class. Is that something that's going to be carried over into? Um, Ruthless Heavens. Well, um, I guess yes and and no because it does have a class system for the first time ever. I think in any of my games, I'm usually not a fan of classes, but I did realize that um, I it's fine if a class works as a starting point without locking you into a specific playstyle. Mm-hmm. So you could start a class. I mean, you could start your character as a healer. But things, thanks to the different mechanics and the way character progression works in in the game, you could end up having warrior skills or a more roguish skills, caster skills. I mean, whatever you want. So the classes here, they, you have the typical, uh, you have the typical warrior, healer, mage, thief. Well, the equivalents in the setting they are not called like that, but. The those the typical classes we are all familiar with when when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, mm-hmm. but like I said, they they give you a specific tool set f- to start that way. That's it. Mm-hmm. You don't have to. If you want, you can stick to to that type of character. It will actually be easier, but it's not necessary because the character progression is completely open. You, it works by learning a different set of skills and. A hundred different skills in the game, which are essentially spells, but not always. And and you can equip a maximum of nine, and, and that's like your power set. So, well, initially you will have the, the four 
uh, starting skills associated with your class, you can end up getting rid of those four if you want. I learn a completely different set mixed with other stuff or I mean yeah flexibility is is what I was going for so mm -hmm. so that's that's the idea I, I had behind the class system to yeah. to use it only as a starting point and not not as something restrictive mm -hmm. yeah the the classes that you ha one of the one of the things I did note when it came to the classes is the re is the appearance change as you rank up so it's the way it, the way it's described it definitely sounds like as you as you advance you are go you're going to be changing more than just your stats but your whole appearance may change by the time you're at the end of your particular journey yeah i think it, it was a little fun flavored thing to add so it in that sense um even though mechanically you're not tied to a class you will always end up being recognized as having started from being from that belonging to a specific class because you will slowly like a like a um, the the roguish type of character they will blend more in shadows or I mean, there's a there's a, the cool thing is this, this is a random table so each time you level up and um, you you well it's not exactly leveling up it's when you rank up there are five ranks even though each rank is separated and is divided into different levels. So you have a, I think it was a D20 t table that you roll on. And so, yeah, it, not not two rogues. I mean, there's a chance that they will end up with the same and details and, and cosmetic differences, but it's a nice variety there for you to 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 get. And I think it's a, it's a fun little flavor thing. Mm -hmm. And one thing I did notice is that you do technically have skills, in in ter at least in terms of the name, but it's not in this. Yeah. It's not a skill system in the sense that a lot of people would expect. What you have as skills would be powers in uh, in other games. Yeah, it's it, they work more like powers, powers. Yeah, uh, spells, powers, uh, abilities, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But yes, the so the our resolution resolution um, system is is the one we are all familiar with. You just roll d twenty at your ability mod modifier, which ab abilities here are called attributes. Mm -hmm. They are the same. It's the six standard array, even though I changed the name of a couple ones, but they are functionally the same. And so, yes, if you want to. Make a perception check. You will roll you know, d twenty plus wisdom, well, or the equivalent in wisdom, which here is spirit. But the skill system it's it's not it's not it's perception, uh, uh, survival, or this kind of things. It's all uh, like you said. It's more like powers or, or or spells, which is like I said, is what defines your capabilities. Most of the time in in combat, but not necessarily. There are a couple of skills which are closer to actual classical skills, like for example, um, alchemy. The only way of learning alchemy is if you equip the alchemy skill, mm -hmm. and that opens a whole different <laughs> sub system yeah. of uh, crafting randomly generated potions, which are completely unique to your own uh, game. Because there's a gigantic table of randomly generated, um, well, puzzle, a lot of combinations and pu pu puzzle combinations between ingredients, effects, where you find them, all those things. Which it turns out um, to be unique to to your own session, basically. Mm -hmm. So yes, in 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 a word, the skills are mostly spells and and powers. Yeah, although it, I has I hesitate to call them. To call them spells, they may be spells in terms of effect, but not in terms of using the spell system that a lot of people in the in the more classic end of things are going to be used to. We're not dealing with the um oh we're not dealing with the Vancian model per se. I mean, oh no, I'm 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 a huge. <laughs> I hate the mansion model. I really actually that's the reason why I stopped playing D and D. Back in the 
late nineties. I when once we discovered Rollmaster, I was like, "What the hell? Why would I use this stupid limit <laughs> system?" I I know some people like it. I just I I don't I never liked it. So I've, you'll not you'll not I've, catch me using it in yeah, any I've, of my games. I've talked I've I've talked about this with you before, and I've talked about this in detail yeah. <laughs> in a lot in a lot of places. The big pro the big problems I've often had with it is the rainy day paradox because when you give players a limited resource they're gonna they're inevitably gonna be conservative with it if you don't give them a reason yeah, exactly. to otherwise um yeah. the 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 other pro the other problem is the fact that there isn't really a narrative justification for it and i i know that may seem seem silly but you look at it. You look at games with other spellcasting systems, and there's usually some kind of in-universe reason for why it's done the way that it is. Why? Why do you have to deal with? Why do you have to deal with the risks of per, of perils of perils of chaos when when doing Warhammer? Well, it's because all magic is tied to chaos in some form. Why do you have? Why do you have to deal with spell drain and Shadowrun? Because casting spells tires you out, you know, that sort of thing. But why? Why the Eight-hour rest is ne is necessary, and the pre and the preparation for spells. The closest is, well, because the creators were fans of Jack Vance, which <laughs> yeah. is an is a out of universe explanation, not an in universe. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. There's, a, there's. So yeah, I guess you can make it work, but uh, there are better systems in my in my opinion. Uh, it's a. It's a, you can make it you can make it work in the same way that you can make a um, game from Bethesda work with mods, but people give Bethesda games so <laughs> so much shit over the fact that you have to <laughs> install a bunch of mods in order to make it work. So if yeah. I don't I don't think that some um, that just house rule or just home rule should be a um catch-all solution for everything it's a spice but you do yeah yeah i agree that said you do kind of ha you do kind of have it in this in the sense of skill of skill usage although one although i could i could argue that the skill usage is more akin to the aedu from D D fourth edition with how you have it s set up um Ever flowings you can use at will, pulsatings once per in, once per encounter, um, um, and celestial once a and day. The, yeah, celestial. Yeah, um, yeah, it's kind of a complete uh, rip off from for e for sure, which, which is a very elegant system. I think it works well. I just and, find it. And I just find I, it. I just find it funny because. So many people have told me that that nothing good came out of 4e, or that it's too much of a war, ga too much of a um, ta too much of a tactical board game, or some, or something like that. And then I keep seeing people take notes from it and use it in their own way. I actually, it's my favorite edition. <laughs> this is com this is coming from a person who doesn't really like D and D to begin with. So the four edition was like. Okay, this is not D and D, so it's it's fantastic. The 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 non casting classes are cool, as equally cool as the casters. The it was perfectly balanced, much better than fifth edition for oh. sure. And the I don't, I don't know. I, don't know. Call I mean, it yes, they, balanced. I mean, star packed warlocks had that had mad problems. Yeah, I was talking more about the the way you build encounters and all these kind of things. Yeah. I, oh yeah, that I, I think had a lot of cool ideas. That I will definitely say, especially the idea of giving monsters roles and create yeah. and um yes. dropping. I was never a fan of CR. I, I'm still I'm still not because it relies on too many assumptions. Um, yeah. but it's very difficult to to use. Well. <sighs> When I say too many assumptions, it's the it's the fact that it's it's basing it it's basing its formulae on the on the party being a balanced party of four. That is yeah. a hell of an assumption to make. And yes. four e instead instead had the roles of different monsters and some suggested packages for um, setting up encounters. Yeah. Oh. Uh, 
but even but even with that, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that you have some skills as replenishers, so that the so that pulsating skills aren't completely lost. That you can you can kind of develop a loop. In that yeah, if, if you're smart, you can really you can really cheat the system in that way. Mm -hmm. In that regard, I suppose I could kind of see the skill system that you have set akin to assembling a power deck. Yeah, that that was definitely my my intention. But actually, the initially I didn't have that that kind of cooldown system. I mean, not cooldown. I, well. Oh, it was a cooldown, like an actual. Yeah, it, no, the whole instead of going the forty way, the game had a. a it worked with cooldown, so you will have a. Each skill will have a. a for, usually, the combat ones will have, um, in a cooldown in rounds. Mm -hmm. Then the more powerful ones will have them in, in days, weeks, even. So, if you realize the ultimate. There are a bunch of skills, the most powerful ones, which are the ultimate skills. Those ones usually are days. They have very long cooldowns. Mm -hmm. But the problem that became evident during playtesting is that it was an absolute pain in the ass to track. Yeah. So every, everybody was forgetting to to, to keep the to keep track of the skills they used. And it was like, oh, this one I'm tracking, was it in hours? Was it minutes? So I was like, oh, just... Pocket. I'm going to 4e. That works <laughs> nicely. It's a good match for this system. And yeah, so I changed that and we play tested it like that again and it worked perfectly. So yeah, yes. And I do, of course, I have, I have, of course, even with that, some of the, oh, some of the, some of the skills have, oh, have a way to, a way to upgrade them, of course, some of, and some of them, some of them can be upgraded more than more than others, but one one But even with all of that, a particular thing that I that I can't help but notice that there isn't a MP or, or anything like that. The limiting factor is what is the um, skill use frequency. Yeah, that's that's the only the only limiting factor and. It worked well. Mm. I I like I like how it works. It's it's very easy to understand. Very, very I don't know. It's flexible and intuitive. So I didn't I didn't think we needed any any other form of limiting the the usage. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's also there's also the fact that um, so that even even without these skills, you have the mechanics for utilizing soul. As as its own form of attack, essentially, uh, and I because of yeah, that's the, a that's a big trope from from all that cultivation genre. Yeah, I mean, being able to impose your aura and all that stuff, weaponizing your aura. Yeah, it's and hell, you see you see that in some manga when it comes to the say the killing yeah. intent, say the killing intent of a of a character. I know that there's. A particular name in Japanese for this concept, I just can't recall what it was at this time. Oh. But I'm, I'm given, not sure either. Sorry. Also, also, I will I will note that if I am to run a character in 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 Ruthless Heavens, I know I know I'm going to lean towards Zenith Guard because I have to work my gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> and, Completely, yeah. It's a good match for you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I ha I'm called the I'm called the monk. Every, everybody keeps call even people who know me as Mildred keep calling me monk. Uh, so why not play as the one that is a monk in all in all but name? Yeah, <laughs> um. yeah, it's 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 a good match, and it's yeah. a fun class actually. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, yeah, yeah, somebody might look at the. St at the domains and and say that might be a bit limiting, but that's not going to be the case. Um, the yeah the the domains the way for, so skills in order to all these skills are 
classified by domain. So you have water, um, different weapon domains, different armor domains, uh, well, for all the elements, uh, void, shadow, mm -hmm. uh, death, life. So there's a, a bunch of domains which are, yeah, different categories of, of skills. So in order to learn a skill, you must know the domain for, from that skill. But you can you can always learn new domains by the same way you learn new skills is basically via loot, like most of the things in the game. Mm -hmm. So yes, you are, you start with a bunch of domains, but you can learn you can eventually learn all of them. There's no limit to that. So mm -hmm. and what I ha what I have no I have noticed is that even though you do have a level system it's not it's not a case of get it's not a case necessarily of um gaining gain of just gaining x amount of experience and then you instantly level up there is a bit more of a process to it regarding both get both getting um essence in some cases get and in some cases having to level up things like soul and lineage before you can even before you can even go up the ranks yeah, so uh, you have the most traditional way of leveling up, which is which will be, it's through essence, which is basically XP, mm -hmm. the typical XP that you gain from combat, and that kind of levels up your body itself. But the problem is that I mean, you can each rank has ten levels, so you can level up. So if you're level one. You could go up to level 10 with your essence, but you will be stuck there until you also level up your your soul and your lineage. And your lineage is like your connection to uh, some kind of powerful ancestor that you had in your in your in your planet or region of space. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make sure you're leveling up the three things, so you're you're capable of of advancing without bottlenecks and usually the way of learning up um, essence like i said is via combat but both soul and, and lineage you need to explore and find natural treasures mm -hmm. or do things for the ruthless heavens to that will benefit you or for different factions so they give you so it forces you to not you can't just go and farm that stuff you can't just go and kill stuff and, and level up no you need to interact with the world and 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 stuff to stuff and well play the game in other words you can't you can't be a murder hobo and yeah. get very far i mean you can but eventually it will be you will get stuck <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and given given the um se given the sector and the given and given the fact that we're deal we're dealing with a sector that is um that is multiple pl that is multiple planets or even even if they're just on one planet um ob obviously the question it's actually of, multiple solar systems yeah, it's it's are, an enormous then that brings the question of how one would get from one planet to the next yeah so the usual thing is through uh, teleport tokens mm -hmm. so when you start the game, you are you basically survive this huge cataclysm that has ravaged your planet. Mm -hmm. It's the arrival of the ruthless heavens. You've been integrated into the path of ascendancy, and and your planet is forever changed. Most of the population is gone, and you only have a bunch of survivors who are rebuilding the the, the civilization. And since you are one of the most powerful individuals. You are kind of the de facto leader mm -hmm. of your small city. So one of the things that the ruthless comes reward you with when you start the game is a teleporter, and with that teleporter you have access to all the different teleporters in in the sector, mm -hmm. only if you have the right teleport token. Start the game with the ability to create as many tokens for your own settlement that you can just give around to give away to whoever you want and a single token to the capital or the 
de facto capital of, of the system, which is the city, the wandering city of Yeros. Mm -hmm. So once you you teleport there, you basically the whole system opens to you. You can get new teleport tokens to to different cities and, and capitals, or the different factions, uh, to the different trials and, and places that you will want to explore to to become more powerful. Of course, there are also vessels to to travel through space because even though it's a science fiction, I mean science fantasy setting, it's mostly um, it's it's like uh, magic versus technology. So you are forced to be in the side of magic because that's the side of the ruthless heavens. And if you go against the heavens, they punish you. There's a whole mechanic in the game that if you use te te technology and or not engage uh, only to destroy technology <laughs> and you try to take advantage of it, you, the, the heavens slowly but surely will gather a power to to you and, and it can kill you. Mm -hmm. So your your the whole setting is is that magic against technology. You have a a faction which are called the engineers, which they are defying the heavens mm -hmm. and, and they are like the the number one enemy. They are always kill on sight. You have uh, this kind of crusades that the that the heavens sometimes set up to destroy their settlements and the outposts and everything. So even though they have, I mean, very advanced technology exists, like completely science fiction stuff, um, robots, uh, spaceships, whatever you can think of, you are not allowed to use that stuff. You are only stuck with the magic stuff, which works perfectly fine, of course. So even the teleporters, they're not mag they're not technological, they're magical. Mm -hmm. All the spaceships you have, they're also magical. Everything is in, in your side of things. Everything is powered by, by essence and, and ether. Mm -hmm. Which works perfectly fine since we're, we're dealing with <clears throat> the... We're, we're dealing with a setting that is mixed, that is mixing the two so how much is pure te is pure tech is going to be is going to be a little bit looser oh yeah exactly and with the, with all of that in with all of that in mind uh oh, when it comes to oh, when it comes to um all get going back on the skills there's also the concept of ultimate skills and I'm curious if I'm cu I'm curious if that was if that was meant to be your your equivalent to almost a limit break like a like approach of just one sort of um capstone ability. Yeah, no, in a way, uh, they do work like that. Or originally, the whole skill system, they all the skills work that way. Which, if you if you look at how ultimate skills. And you compare them to spells from DCC. It's it's the same system. So the the higher you roll, the better results you get. And that that's one of the things that, uh, like I said, it started as a DCC hack. So mm -hmm. so originally all skills worked that way. But then I realized that it will be cooler to just have your ultimate skill. So like I mentioned before, you can have a maximum of nine skills, and and they are th these skills when you first absorb them, they kind of appear like weird uh, tattoos that slowly fade away, but they uh, they place themselves into different parts of your body. So the ultimate skill goes into your forehead. You can only have one ultimate in that because regard, you only have you could, one, one slot. In that regard, you could kind of see the skills as aligning to one's chakras. Yeah, and, and it works a little bit like that. You have your more combat skills which go on, on your on your arms, arms and forearms, then your movement skills go on your legs, then the general utility and skills go on your on your torso. Mm -hmm. So they are divided that way. Yeah. And yeah, so the ultimate is definitely like your <laughs> most powerful ability. You you can only use it once a day usually. And and yeah, you can only have one. Mm -hmm. And there's also there's also, the concept of set of sed sending things to settlements—you do have a bit of a settlement system. I'd like to go into that as far as 
how that's going to how that's going to work. Is it like a domain system in the traditional sense, or is it a little bit different? Yeah, in a way, I guess it's a little bit uh, like your traditional domain. Like I mentioned before, you are the de facto leader of your little city and, and planet, and you are trying to to ensure the survival of, of your civilization and your fellow citizens, because the moment other big empires and big factions of the sector find out that your planet has been incorporated into the into the path of ascendancy, well you are you're in big trouble because they will start searching for you. Actually the most factions because all the new all the new assimilated planets appear always in, in the area of the sector, which is like the outside the the outer rim. So they know that even though that area is pure chaos and very difficult to navigate with ships, they still send scouts to try to find this newly assimilated planets because they're like gold mines for them. They can go strip mine of all the useful resources. Usually they, since they have just been in, integrated into the path of ascendancy, they, they are very rich in resources. They have uh, uh, a lot of potential. And also they, they make sure that if in the future it could become a threat. Well, that threat is eliminated before before it has a the chance to to become a problem. Mm -hmm. So, so as the leader, it's in your best interest to send resources, which is generally uh, crystals, which is the currency of of the game, and to to ensure you build up your your capital. So you have this. Um, um, and the the downtime phase of the game between, so you'll do like one mission, which will be a trial, uh, hunting ground or whatever. Different, there are different kinds of missions or activities you can do with your character. And in between, you will return to your planet and see how things are are doing. And each time you go there, well, you have a have random events that can happen. They can attack your planet or they can find some survivors that they didn't find before and help your grow your settlement or I mean there's a huge table with with downtime stuff that can happen. And you will slowly build you have a selection of buildings and and each building benefits you and your settlement in, in different ways. So you can have better defenses so in case they attack you you you're protected. You can have um there's a a trophy room for example, for when you kill rare, unique beasts, you can bring them and they they boost your settlement uh, with a different series of benefits. Uh, you can have uh, well, you you definitely are going to want a skill repository, which is um, you you will get skill shards, and those skill shards you need to exchange them at your skill repository to uh, for for the uh, a different selection of skills. And that's also the way you also have a different building for for domains. But yeah, you have a lot of of different buildings that are going to help you in one way or another. So in that sense, everything you build is going to to benefit you directly. Mm -hmm. So with that with that said, uh, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count? I know because of the amount of stuff that's being introduced, this is going to be a bit of a beefy boy. Um, well, the the book is finished, so barring any potential stretch goals, which, for example, the the first stretch goal, um, which I'm pretty sure we will hit, um, that one should add a few extra pages because it's is the I want to add a way of creating randomly generated trials, which are like. Um, there's a mix of dungeons, but not not only dungeons, um, places to explore. They are like missions that the, the have established for ascendants, which is your character. Your character you play as an ascendant, somebody who's walking the path of ascendancy. So, to the what the heavens, what they want is people to become stronger, usually through conflict. So, 
you are generally able to play the game completely in sandbox mode, but you have these fixed places where you can go and and do like a like a mission offered by the by the heavens. And so only only ascendants can access them. They're generally like, for example, the first um, file you will you will go through. It's it's like a, it's very typical um, dungeon crawl. You you'll go to some ancient forge and deal with with the stuff that's going on there. So I want to create a a series of tables and tools so you can randomly generate all these different trials, which is very very useful if you're a solo player. And oh well, if you're a GM too, of course you can just have a, a new trial that will last you a couple of game sessions in a moment. So um, that I, I still don't know how much it will it will expand the book. Right now, the book is around three hundred pages. It's a six times nine inches in, in format, but I I don't think it will go over three hundred fifty pages. As usual with all my games, though, it's it's mostly tables and tables and tables and random tools. It has a huge selection of of solo tools and NPC generating stuff <laughs> it's just a lot of a lot of tools mm -hmm. and with and um with that in mind what would you be shooting for as far as a release window not a date per se but a general ballpark i'm i'm guessing it should be done by fall like I said, the book is finished. I mean, the layout is done. Every, everything is done. The only thing that is missing is the any potential stretch goals. But I'm very since those will be depending on myself. I'm quite efficient writing. Is is all I do. Mm -hmm. I know I can have that done in in a month. And so the only thing that will really delay the the release will be the the art, which. I have a lot of different artists, but still, uh, art of this quality takes time, and and I I don't want to rush the the, the different artists. I I want them to to be able to create whatever they want and take as long as they they need. So there's a lot of art which I it's already included in the book, but there's still I don't know at least thirty more pieces or something like that missing. So yes, I'm, I'm. I hope. I think uh, it can be done by by fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I can certainly get that, and I'll be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Well, thank you for having me again. It was it was fun, like always. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>